the United States and the Soviet Union on a sheet of ice in Lake Placid, New York. Muller trying to turn. There's the left foot. What a tracking shot. Johnny Muller. If you see a 9-9, Olga Corbett won a gold medal. There it is. Five seconds left in the game. Do you believe in miracles? Yes! Unbelievable. You're listening to a podcast from Key Moments in Cold War Sports History, an online archive series showcasing the work of expert historians. I'm Vince Hunt and I'll be hosting the series, asking each guest to choose an important document or artefact they think is of great significance in the Cold War sports arena. Ice hockey's always been a rough, tough sport, not for the faint-hearted. It's a contact sport in the purest sense of the idea. But what about the unwritten rules, the male codes that lie behind the face masks and the body slams, the sensitivities of the dressing room, perhaps? Erica Fraser of Carleton University, Ottawa, has focused her recent research on ice hockey in the Soviet Union in the immediate post-war years. Well, Erica, I mean, that's an incredibly difficult period for the Soviet Union because of all the casualties in the war. Yeah, it really is. And um, the Soviet Union lost more men in World War II than all other combatant countries combined, actually. Figures of uh, upwards of 20 million men dead or wounded. Uh, So coming out of the war, you know, I'm looking at what's a real dearth of masculinity culture in the Soviet Union in the late 1940s, a dearth of male bodies and men, but also a sense... um, that we're we're going to see in sports culture of trying to re-masculinize Soviet culture. One of the things I would say is a factor of that immediate post-war period would be the the sense that we may not be here tomorrow and and this idea that that would uh, attack uh, any ideas of, of, of masculinity in the longer term, that the close surroundings of death might really affect a, a sports mentality. There's a, a sense in Soviet culture of denying, well, and from the government, really, of almost denying the war had happened afterwards. We don't see commemoration for some years later, uh, and it's very much business as usual. There really isn't uh, any allowance for talking about the war or about wounds or veterans. There's a celebration of veterans, of course, um, but nothing about the trauma coming out of the war. Uh, and sports is, is a way for uh, the country to continue pretending it's business as usual. Uh, and so what they do is adopt this new uh, hockey style of play from North America after 1945. The first games are played at the end of 46. And I think that's part of this recovery motif in in Soviet culture that we're not talking about the war, but let's move forward with this new quote-unquote tough man's game and cast Soviet men in this role of tough hockey players to prove that we are still, you know, here and manly after the devastation of the war. And would the situation be confused by the fact that there would still be a, a, a large number of sportsmen in uniform? Sure, sure, yeah, and advertising uh, veterans uh, who were also sports heroes in the late 1940s, for instance, was a great sort of PR campaign. Sievolod Babrov, this famous uh, guy who played both football and hockey to great acclaim uh, and was a star in both sports in the late 40s, but it's part of denying that veterans could have been wounded or traumatized. They're heroes. They're uh, the toughest men in the world. They defeated Nazi extremism. Uh, you know, in the most violent war the world had ever seen, the Soviet forces won. And so to have these veterans come out and play sports afterwards, uh, some for the, the army team, certainly, I think was a way of trying to showcase victory without, again, talking about the war too much by just moving forward and, and showcasing these unwounded male bodies, but many male bodies were wounded or malnourished or had experienced trauma. And so, you know, either among veterans or a next generation of of boys who'd grown up during the war and might play later in the 50s, uh, hockey or football, they have physical issues. There's not necessarily a a pool of healthy young bodies to push into sport. So, of course, one of the immediate problems is the falling out between the Allies, between the Soviet Union and the, uh, and the Americans. So 
Where did the Soviet Union look for its new model? Well, it adopts this Canadian style of play that there had been some negotiations since the early 30s uh, to to start playing uh, Canadian style hockey, as they called it. Uh, and really, it was about uh, the, the Soviet Union trying to get back into international competition. Uh, uh, it had been ostracized and, and isolated uh, in many ways uh, from uh, the international community in the 20s and 30s after the revolution. Uh, and part of uh, trying to get back in on that would be, you know, they played a Russian version of hockey that no one else in the world played. It was a game on ice with sticks, uh, but that's uh, the only thing in common, really. And so, uh, it, you know, they it's not uh, a new thing after 45. There'd been conversations about joining this style of hockey that Canadians and Americans and uh, Germans and West Europeans were playing, but it doesn't happen until 46. And I think that's really significant that it, certainly the war interrupted some of those negotiations that had happened earlier. They still didn't have to adopt it in 46. And so at the same time, we see diplomatic relations deteriorating we also see this adoption of Canadian hockey in 46 in, in domestic leagues in the Soviet Union, not just for international competition. Uh, and so I'm still working out what that means, but I think it's, it's you know, part of it, and my work on masculinity especially, is, is showing uh, the Soviet Union wants to be in this sort of Nordic brotherhood with Canadian and American and West European uh, men's hockey teams. This is something that bridges Cold War animosity, really. The animosity is there, so certainly in international tournaments, and yet this ice, conversation on ice, if you will, that the Soviet Union wants to be part of by adopting these Canadian-style rules and, and having its, its players uh, play this way. What kind of atmosphere are the games played in? I, I, I've been to hockey matches which are incredibly exciting. I, I would assume that the players would draw energy from this, that would go in harder, they would fight harder, they would really want to give all for their fans. Is, is this something that's coming through in your research, the, the relationship between the fans and the players? There's certainly uh, quite a bit of that. Um, and when they're building these new stadiums, playing this new kind of hockey, it becomes one of the most popular sports in the country. Uh, football will always be the, the most uh, popular and, and famed, uh, but uh, hockey and basketball are close seconds and, and third. And, and so there definitely is a affiliation, I think, with the fans, with a sense of, of rooting for the team, either in domestic, uh, certainly in international hockey, uh, and of being part of, of a game that, that you know, gives back to the fans and, and is, you know, conveying the socialist message of the collective and of the good life and, and leisure and sport can be part of a fulfilling socialist life. This is something that, the, you know, Soviet sport is always trying to, to convey. Um, and it becomes uh, rooted in, in Soviet culture, really. Um, in 1968, there's a famous song written that's still famous in post-Soviet Russia, as far as I know, uh, that sort of encapsulates, I think, the sentiment from the late 40s through to 68 when it's written. It's called, Real Men Play Hockey, uh, No Coward Plays Hockey. Uh, it's written by a poet uh, in 68 and becomes sort of the unofficial anthem of, of uh, Soviet hockey. What are real men, uh, in, in Russian, what are, the, what are these genuine real men who are playing hockey? Uh, and so I've been analyzing this a little bit. And oddly, to me at least, the lyrics of the song don't talk about physical brutality or, or excessive force or violence the way you might assume. It's really just a song that narrates a hockey game. Players skate forward, uh, they want to score a goal. It's very benign sort of lyrics. And yet the chorus says, real men play hockey, no coward plays hockey. The ears ring with the bold music of an attack, make an accurate pass, shoot hard, and everything is right if on the ice are the magnificent five and a goalkeeper. The Ice Brotherhood fights hard, and we trust in the courage of daring guys. Real men play hockey, no coward plays hockey. Победной молнией пульсирует фонарь, но если...
Let the space behind the rival's goal be more frequently illuminated by the red lamp's victorious flash. But if there's a need, defend brilliantly the magnificent five and a goalkeeper. Many beautiful games will be seen, and we won't forget, we'll never forget, as long ago golden cups have been won at ice battles by the Magnificent Five and a goalkeeper. Real men play hockey, no coward plays hockey. So I've been looking at what does that mean? What does cowardice mean then if it doesn't seem to fit what we would assume from the West of uh, tough guy versus sissy sort of language that you see in North American hockey? Um, and as best I can tell, they're really just looking again in the post-war context in the Soviet Union at, at real men as just good Soviet citizens. It doesn't have to mean uh, excessive muscles or violence, as I say. Um, just follow the rules, be good to your teammates, uh, score some goals, and you won't be a coward. You know, it's it's almost it's less exciting than I want it to be. It's just this is the path to a good socialist man. You'd say then that the seeds of modern Soviet hockey or modern uh, hockey in the Soviet Union later to be Russia were sown in the immediate post-war years of reconstruction uh, and so on. And, and of course the Soviet Union went on to be an absolute powerhouse in international hockey. Yeah, absolutely. And really quickly, um, by 1952, I believe, they're winning uh, Olympic and world titles uh, regularly. Uh, and so having only adopted this new style of play in 46 to already, you know, less than 10 years later, be internationally dominant uh, against the Swedes, the Czechs, the Canadians especially are outraged <laughs> about some of this. Uh, how dare they lose to this, this young hockey country in the Soviet Union? Uh, and, and so they really become a, an international powerhouse, which, uh, you know, feeds domestic hockey and is popularity, certainly. Uh, these, you know, uh, teams of, of, what, 12 guys or so playing internationally become uh, certainly heroes uh, to, to the uh, domestic leagues and the more junior leagues and boys, you know, uh, certainly up and coming. It really is part of post-war reconstruction. One thing that I've found in my research that I find really fascinating, I'm looking into more, is uh, women had played hockey before World War II, uh, this Russian style of hockey outdoors with the shorter sticks and whatnot. Uh, and they don't, as best I can tell, are not allowed to play this new Canadian version after 46. Uh, and something similar happens in Canada, actually. Women are playing at the turn of the century and, and through the 30s, uh, and again are shut out until uh, more recently, the past 10, 15 years, when women's hockey is returned to the Olympics and the World stage. Uh, so this is something else across the Cold War divide that, that the, the, this masculinization of hockey occurs only after World War II in Canada, in, in the Soviet Union, possibly in other countries, I'm not sure. Uh, but for Soviet culture, uh, I think it's really significant that women are written out of the hockey narrative, that it really is a game for men, not just by default, but that women had played uh, and are not allowed to play uh, after 46 in this new style of play. Uh, so, so again, this post-war context of remasculinizing culture and, and achievement in a way and, and sort of showcasing what men can do as men uh, uh, that women can't be part of, I think is really uh, particular to the post-war context uh, and significant when we talk about this you know, the Soviet excellence in hockey, that it could have gone a different way. It could have been a more unique Soviet contribution of, of women's hockey uh, because the Soviet Union was actually very uh, committed to women's equality as a socialist country, uh, and yet they purposefully make it a men's sport. You've been listening to a podcast from the series Key Moments in Cold War Sports History, a project bringing together experts from around the world and hosted here on the Wilson Centre's online digital archive at digitalarchive.org. 
These podcasts are part of the project The Global History of Sport in the Cold War, which is sponsored by the National Endowment of the Humanities, directed by Professor Bob Edelman of UC San Diego, Professor Chris Young from the University of Cambridge, and Dr Christian Osterman of the Woodrow Wilson Centre, and run in collaboration with the German Historical Institute Moscow, the Jordan Centre for Advanced Russian Studies at New York University, and Pembroke College, University of Cambridge. The presenter is Vince Hunt and the series is produced by Vince Hunt and Laura Deal.